Good morning again, Kent Cove. Our text this morning comes to us from 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, and it reads like this. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. So recently, a little while ago, I got some new glasses. And uh, as I was doing that, you know, as you get a little bit older, you have to go a little more frequently for eye tests. And they always make me a little anxious because you're doing these tests and they do the whole, uh, is it better here or here? Three or four, five or six, seven or four, three, two, one. And they just keep switching it, right? And you know as you're doing this, or at least for me, I feel like, oh my goodness, well, three was pretty good, but four might be a little better, might be a little worse. I'm not sure. And the faster they go the more anxious I get because I realize that I'm going to, one, spend a lot of money on these stupid progressive lenses, and two, I'm going to see everything through them. And if I don't get it right, I'm going to be seeing everything a little bit off for the foreseeable future, probably the next 24 months until insurance will not quite pay for much of anything for the eyeglasses, right? So you get this sense of like, oh, I've got to get it exactly right. And and it just is kind of nerve-wracking. Now, I'm not telling you this to troll for compliments on my frames that I chose uh, or, you know, anything like that. But what this morning we're thinking about as we continue this series called The Affirmations, we're thinking about our value as a covenant people of the Bible, as of the Scriptures, as our only authority in matters of faith, doctrine, and conduct. This is one of our six affirmations. And the reason it, I think about that will become clear in a minute, but I want to just review, for, for some of you, you maybe are very familiar with what these six affirmations are. For others, you're going, what is he talking about? So I'm going to run through them real quick. Um, The the six affirmations of the covenant church are the Bible as the only authority in matters of faith, doctrine, and life, uh, the necessity of new birth, the church as a fellowship of believers, the commitment to the whole mission of the church, a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit, and the reality of freedom in Christ. Now, if you're interested in reading more about these, you can go to covchurch.org and you can find the the longer writings about these affirmations and what it is that we're saying about them. But one of the sayings that we have in the covenant is, where is it written? So some of you are maybe familiar with that. If you've been around for a long time, you maybe even know the Swedish version, var står det skrivet? How'd I do, babe? Pretty good? All right. Uh, she speaks Swedish, so I always have to check. Um, but the, and that story of how that came about is interesting. We don't really have time to get into it, but one of our founding fathers, a guy with, uh, called P.P. Waldenstrom, yeah, I know, um, Paul Peter Waldenstrom was a, a Lutheran pastor in Sweden, and he was having this argument with another pastor about atonement theology, like we do, and as they were arguing about it, he looked at the other guy and said, well, where is that written? And so the question for us as covenant people is always going back to the text and saying, where is it written? Now, we need to be careful about that because we're not just proof texting we're actually doing something even more dangerous than proof texting. We're inviting uh, the Scripture to form us, and we're inviting dialogue with one another around the Scripture to really dig in and explore what is it that God is trying to teach us through this 
text. So think of that phrase, that question, where is it written, not as proof texting, but as invitation. We're going to talk more about that later. But before we get kind of more into this, I want, to, want you to think about what do you think of when you think of the Bible? What do you think of when you think of the Bible? Do you think rule book? Do you think textbook? Do you think a problem to be solved? Do you think a really confusing mishmash of books from all kinds of different times and periods and cultures and trying to figure it out is hard and daunting? We have all of these different ways of engaging with Scripture. And these uh, ways that we view Scripture are examples of one of the sets of lenses that we view the Scriptures through. Because what the reality is, is that we all have lenses that we see Scripture through. And if we read Scripture without an awareness of our lenses, then we're approaching it as if we already know what it says and what it means for us. And I would suggest that as a pastor that one of the most dangerous things to our walk of faith to our souls is approaching the Scripture as if we already know what it says. Because when we do that, we become rigid, and then we become mean. I've seen it happen over and over again, and I'm sure if we sat down over a cup of coffee, we could tell each other stories of that person who came at us knowing what they knew about Scripture and how they knew it, and that they knew that everybody else was wrong, right? So what are our lenses? What are the lenses that we see Scripture through? Well, there are a lot of them, right? So primarily, though, for us in this room, we come at Scripture, and this is just because of where we were born, right? The majority of people in this room come at Scripture from a Western, American, individualistic understanding of life. And so we read Scripture with those lenses in place. We also have lenses like family of origin. We have lenses of what was the faith tradition, if any, that we were raised in. Was it, was it rigidly, rigidly conservative fundamentalist, or was it, you know, anything goes, you know, boho hippiedom, or whatever it was, right? Those all influence how we read Scripture. And here's the thing. We can't not, yes, I know it's a double negative, we can't not have lenses. It's part of being human, right? We all have them, but we can be aware of those lenses and choose to discard the bad ones or at least try to discard those lenses that are not helpful for allowing Scripture to speak into our lives. And so this text that we read this morning All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, there's so much that we could say about this text. The work of being formed by Scripture is is building a framework through which we understand how to apply it, and this verse is is one of ours. It seems simple, and in some ways it is, but when we really dig in, we recognize that the work that is before us, just in this one simple verse, is or could be overwhelming, right? So let's walk through this just a little bit. Um, and, but before we do that, I, w- I do want to say one thing, and that is that we in the covenant have always uh, approached Scripture with this humble attitude of coming, returning to Scripture over and over again and having dialogue about what it means. I remember in seminary, I did my systematic theology paper on the authority of Scripture in the covenant, right? And my professor was a guy named John Wieborg. Now, maybe some of you have had the pleasure of meeting John. 
others of you, what I will say about John is I would guess that John Weborg is the smartest human being that I have ever interacted with personally. This guy is, was brilliant. And as I was struggling with what does it mean that Scripture has authority and what does it mean that we say that, that Scripture is the, is the rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct and all of this, because when you start looking at authority of Scripture and studying it, you start to hear all kinds of words, especially in the evangelical world, about Scripture. You hear words like inerrant and verbal plenary inspiration and all kinds of different things, and, and it can get pretty confusing. Now, the covenant, we've never used those words, and here, and John Weborg distilled it for me as to why. As I was struggling with what we meant about Scripture, John looked at me and said this. He said, we can never say anything about Scripture that Scripture does not say about itself. That is the most covenant sentence I think I've ever heard. Right? So when, when people start using all these different terms to describe what Scripture is, we as covenant people say, well, if that's helpful for you, fine, but that's not, those are not words that you find in Scripture. Right? There are words that describe maybe the ideas behind those, but not those specific words. And so that's part of who we are is that we continually return to Scripture and ask what it means. So, as we look at this verse, we think of the following things. Well, the first thing that we have to ask is all Scripture. Now, we hear this with our Western lens, our post-resurrection, several thousand years into church history lens, and we hear all Scripture and we think, Old Testament, New Testament, all of that, right? But when this letter was written, all Scripture was simply the Old Testament because the New Testament was just being written because it was in that letter, right? All Scripture. So what does that mean, right? We have to engage with that. But all Scripture, we affirm that all Scripture, the Old and the New Testament, is uh, God-breathed. That it, is, that it comes from God and that it's useful for all the things that, this, that we um, read that it was. But as we understand this idea of whole Scripture and we recognize, we have to ask that question then. Well, if when Timothy received this letter and Paul wrote all Scripture, but at the time all Scripture didn't include the New Testament, what does that mean? I mean, these are the kinds of things that we wrestle with, but I think the key to it comes in the verses right before the verses that we read. In verse 14 and 15, it reads this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So what does this context tell us? Well, it tells us that the way, one of the ways that we understand what all Scripture is and how we got to have, which which letters went in the New Testament, all of those questions is community discernment. Communal discernment. Did you hear it in the text? But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. Friends, I'm convinced that one of the ways that we recognize the work of Scripture is the fruit that it produces in our lives. Essentially, in one way, what Paul is saying here is that if you're wondering how to know what to believe, cling to what you were taught because you know who taught it to you, right? Which doesn't mean we should never listen to anybody new, But I think it does hint at something. It hints at, well, look at the fruit of their lives. Friends, if you are listening to brothers and sisters in Christ whose lives are, the fruit of their lives are filled with anger and fear and suspicion and all kinds of conspiracy theories and whatever else, my suggestion is, is that they are not showing the fruit of what Scripture teaches. And so then maybe perhaps we should consider 
whether or not to trust those sources. Paul reminds Timothy that the reason he can trust these scriptures is because he knows those from whom he learned it. In other words, he knows them, he knows the fruit of their lives, he knows that they are devoted followers of Jesus who demonstrate, who are, who are those who have been thoroughly equipped for every good work, right? It balances out in what we see. The whole context of this passage recognizes, and this is one of the lenses that we have to challenge in ourselves, recognizes that Scripture is best read in community. That's one that we struggle with, friends. We want to read the Bible and say, well, I understand what this means, and I know what it means for me, right? Well, that may be true, but it also operates within community, And we, as we read the Scriptures, while individual understanding is important, corporate understanding is even more important. We need to discern together what the Scriptures mean and engage with one another on it and to be formed by it. One of my favorite stories from covenant history comes from uh, one of our forebears whose name was Nils Lund. He was a professor at North Park Seminary. And he describes the people's relationship to the Bible like this. He says that the Bible is like a beautiful large house with many different rooms, some of which are more inviting than others. In, those, in this house there are those rooms that are favorites and others that are never visited. Okay? So he goes on to say, the general viewpoint for them is the practical, the religious And clearly, an older woman whom I knew belonged to this class. She was deeply religious. Her pastor had given a scholarly lecture on the subject, how we got our Bible. The purpose was good, and the lecture was no doubt very illuminating. But when the dear sister shared her impressions with another believer, she burst out impatiently. Surely it does not matter how we got our Bible, only that we have it. She lived in the house and felt well there, but she felt no need to hear how it had been built. Nor did she feel any desire to take a journey through the neighborhood and view the surroundings. Friends, we want to be people who know how the house was built, or who at least explore how the house was built and the neighborhood that it exists in. One of, one of the challenges that we have, I think, in American Christianity in these days is a sin called bibliolatry. And this essentially is difficult to name because how dare you say that the Bible could be a sin, right? Well, the Bible becomes sinful when we elevate it above Jesus. Pete Enns reminds us that the Bible is a messy book. He says this, the writings that would eventually make up the Bible were composed and eventually collected over a period of about a thousand years in times of war and peace, triumph and tragedy, under Assyrian, then Babylonian, Persian, and Roman rule, in a plethora of social settings written by simple folk, kings, priests, prophets, and who knows who else in three different languages. Friends, the idea that the Scriptures are an, are an easy book to understand is false. And we do ourselves a disservice when we proof text and use Scripture in such a way that makes it seem like it's just this simple book, right? That's not to say that we, sh- that we should discourage people from engaging it. Actually, quite the opposite. It's just to say that unlike most things that we like in our culture, it's not easy. It takes work and patience and above all, humility. We have to be humble enough to sit down together over the Word and hear our brothers and sisters and how they hear the text and to allow ourselves to be challenged by that. You see, sometimes what we do is we elevate, we take Scripture and we use it like a club. 
I've even heard people quote Scripture to justify such behavior. They'll talk about, well, I need to just take up the sword of truth as if God has commissioned them to take up the Bible and stab everyone they ever met with it. Right? If the, if the Bible is the sword of truth, my contention would be that it is not to be used as a weapon against others, but as a tool to set us and them free. Brothers and sisters, if we use the Scripture in such a way that points to a God who the Scriptures does not testify to, then we are misusing Scripture, and we are grieving the heart of God. When we use the Scriptures to beat people over the head that we don't agree with, when we use Scriptures to wound others because we don't happen to agree with their particular decisions, when we use Scriptures to exclude people who God loves, we do damage to ourselves and to them. The Scriptures are, for us, an invitation, right? They're an invitation to understand God. They're an invitation to come into relationship with God and to be formed more into the image of His Son, Jesus. I'm reminded of back when Gretchen and I got married 30-some years ago, we were told, or I remember reading somewhere, that God did not give us our spouse to make us happy. He gave us our spouse to make us holy. Okay, whoa, right? Right? I I would take that and apply it to Scripture and say God does not give us the Scriptures to prove that we're right. He gives us the Scriptures to prove that we desperately need Jesus. And so as we engage the Scriptures, we do so with an awareness of our lenses, with an awareness of our shortcomings, with an awareness of the places where we simply need to be able to admit that we don't know and to do the hard work of trying to understand what that Scripture means today. We need to engage that invitation with a willingness to allow Scripture to take those lenses away and replace them with kingdom lenses. Lenses that demonstrate the values and understanding of Jesus' kingdom. And through that story, then, we get invited to participate with Jesus in the unfolding story of God's redemption of all things. Because ultimately, that's what the Scriptures are. They are the story of God's pursuit of the redemption of all things. From beginning to end. And it is my hope and prayer that we as a covenant church will always have and hold as a place of honor the Scriptures and the authority of Scriptures. But that we will do so with humility and respect for our brothers and sisters. That we will do it honestly, prayerfully, guided by the Spirit, so that it produces the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. And if it produces anything other than the fruits of the Spirit and us looking more and more like Jesus, then we're not doing it right. That, friends, is just the cold, hard truth. The Scriptures are there as an invitation to join God in God's story of our redemption, of your redemption, of the world's redemption. So the question then becomes, will we allow the Scriptures to challenge us, to form us, and to move us deeper into Christ and further in His mission?